This is a video which I've been putting off for a long time, but I promised I would get done, so here it is. I read Hillary Clinton's book. Hey, what happened? What I have to say now will not be fresh. I read the book quite a while ago and it came out on September the 12th, 2017. Nonetheless, I've committed to this shit, so I have to do it. Why did I read Hillary Clinton's book? Hillary Clinton lost the election on the 8th of November, 2016 against Donald Trump. If you just want to see things with rose-tinted glasses, because it makes you feel like Trump might win and then you'll feel better about your life and then you can complain about everything being rigged. Good luck with that because you are losing not only this election but your alignment with reality. She made a book deal with Simon & Schuster for her book around February 2017. At the time it was just personal selected essays which she sold to Simon & Schuster and which eventually materialized into this book. She began discussing the book openly in public on the 1st of June 2017. Well this book is uh, for me a really um, personal deep experience and I also have to say an emotional catharsis. Now when I heard about the book at the time I was like oh Fucking hell, not Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is just frustrating and annoying due to her neoliberal tendencies. She just lost the election. Second time that she's lost running for president. Why doesn't she just go away? So I went to Twitter to express my discontent with her book. Some of my followers who are normally quite friendly with me were very dissatisfied and angry with how I was talking about Hillary Clinton. Oh, so it's fine for a man. Bernie Sanders book came out in August of 2017 and you were fine with that. You didn't give a shit. You just care because it's Hillary and you hate women. You're a Bernie pro. The thing about you is... Woman hater. It's just... You're sexist. And I was like, hey, that's really unfair. That's not the reason I think that. And they said, you've prejudged the book before you've even read it or seen it. You couldn't possibly know what you're talking about until you've read the fucking book. You hypocrite. You misogynist. Perfectly acceptable for anybody else to talk about anything, isn't it? I was actually curious about that. Following his defeat in 1996, Bob Dole became a TV celebrity in infomercials. Hi, I'm Bob Dole. And I've always spoken to you, frankly, no matter what the subject. That's why I'm eager to tell you about a product that put real joy back in my life. It helps me feel youthful, vigorous, and most importantly, vital again. What is this amazing product? My faithful little blue friend. An ice cold Pepsi-Cola. Did guest appearances on things, but from what I can tell he was not highly influential in his party or trying to influence his party platform, Bob Dole being a Republican, outside of being some elder statesman who just hang around at events and that kind of thing. Following his defeat in 2000, Gore was quiet for about two years or so, whereupon he started criticizing George Bush's policy in Iraq. Following his defeat in 2004, John Kerry, the Democrat, went back to the Senate and just got on with his job. I have to give a bit of a pass to people who lost who were in the Senate because they still had their job to get on with and it's a very public job. So so long as they went grandstanding, I mean it's not really cashing in to just go back to your job, in my opinion. Following his 2008 defeat, McCain returned to the Senate and soon fought against Obama's stimulus package. He remained in the public eye due to his role in the Senate and he did try to lead the Republicans in many fights against Obama, so he didn't quite slither away into the shadows. Following his 2008 defeat, Romney declined media appearances to avoid overexposure. His book, No Apology, The Case for American Greatness, came out about a year and four months or so after his defeat. After his 2012 defeat, Romney kept a low profile and he resurfaced in 2014 to endorse candidates and get involved in his party politics again. Sarah Palin doesn't quite count um, as part of this collection because she was a vice presidential nominee, not the actual main candidate. What newspapers and magazines did you regularly read before you were tapped for this to stay informed and to understand the I've world. read most of them again with a great appreciation for the press, for the media. But like what I mean, specifically? I'm curious that you... Um, all of them, any of them that um, have, have been in front of me over all these years. But she had no such reticence 
about cashing in on her situation. Following her defeat on November 4th, 2008, she leapt right into guest appearances on Fox News and she milked her fame as much as she possibly could before abruptly resigning from a governorship in July 2009 for the sake of cashing in. She's basically like, fuck the people. I've determined it's best to transfer the authority of governor to Lieutenant Governor Parnell. And I am willing to do this so that this administration with its positive agenda and its accomplishments and its successful road to an incredible future for Alaska so that it can continue without interruption and with great administrative and legislative success. Released a whole bunch of stupid books and she launched an online political commentary network that lasted from July 2014 to July 2015 before folding. We believe, oh, wait, I thought fast food joints? Oh, don't you guys think that they're like of the devil or something? That's what liberals, you want to send those evil employees who would dare work at a fast food joint that you just don't believe in. thought you wanted to, I don't know, send them to purgatory or something. So they all go vegan and uh, wages and picket lines. I don't know. They're not often discussed in purgatory, are they? I don't know. Why are you even worried about fast food wages? Because, well, Sarah Palin is not a good point of comparison. It's just funny that she was like, look, I'm not going to be in the spotlight for that long. I got to make the most of this. I got to get as much fucking money and exposure as I possibly can. So looking back on all that, I definitely think Hillary Clinton wanted to get involved in her party's politics a lot sooner and a lot more intensely than a lot of previous presidential candidates. She didn't have a role to go back to. She was just walking around in the woods like, I'm fucking bored. I want to get back into this shit. Whereas Bernie Sanders didn't quite have that problem because he is still in the Senate. Was the criticism that was a double standard with Hillary Clinton fair because Bernie Sanders had a book and he got involved in things. I'd say only really half fair because Hillary definitely seems to want to influence the next cycle. She's already influenced two cycles and she wants to do it again. As I watched uh, Senator Sanders on TV yesterday defending himself uh, from what you have said in your book and I'm wondering why did you go there reopening a barely healed wound in your own party. When I lost to Barack Obama, I immediately turned around, I endorsed him, I worked for him, I convinced my supporters to vote for him. I didn't get the same uh, respect from my primary opponent. And a lot of his supporters continue to harass and you know, really uh, go after my supporters all the time. And that feeds in I think, to the whole sexism and misogyny uh, part of this campaign. I am proud to be a Democrat. I've been a Democrat for decades. I have supported Democrats. I've worked for Democrats. Bernie's not a Democrat. And, and that's not a slam. That's what he says himself. And I think a lot of what uh, he churned up in the primary campaign was very uh, hurtful in the general election against me. And I see him doing the same thing. I see him, you know, with his supporters. He doesn't disown the things they say about, you know, some of my favorite Democrats, people like Kamala Harris, who is out there speaking up and speaking out, and she's being attacked from the left. Enough. You know, if you don't want to support Democrats, then go somewhere else. Hillary Clinton has... You remember her? Hillary Clinton has her name on a, a new book about her ill-fated run for the presidency, which I'm excited about. I was just thinking to myself this morning, I would love to relive that magical election of 2016. <laughs> it's like reading a book about why the Titanic sank while you're sitting at the bottom of the ocean. Right? <laughs> And while Bernie is focused a lot more on certain principles and ideals, Hillary just kind of seems like she can't let go. So I think the criticism is half fair. Obviously she's allowed to get out her thoughts. So some followers of mine were very pissed off about that. So I said, fine, I'll fucking read her book then. I'll read her whole fucking book. I'll read every goddamn word of her fucking book. And then I'll get back to you and I'll tell you whether I still think that she's opportunistic and she's cashing in and she's arrogant and egotistical and she's the old guard and she's establishment. She can't fucking let go of this thing. Then we'll fucking see. So I did. I read her book.
Got it here on the Kindle and I took some notes. Now I want to be fair. I don't want to just be a negative Nancy and a mindless Hillary Clinton hater. Maybe she's a lot more self-reflective than she seems in the snippets. The famous snippet was when she was being very dismissive of Bernie's idea of universal health care. Jake Sullivan, my top policy advisor, told me it reminded him of a scene from the 1998 movie There's Something About Mary. A deranged hitchhiker says he's come up with a brilliant plan. Instead of the famous eight minute abs exercise routine, he's going to market seven minutes minute abs. It's the same, just quicker. Then the driver, played by Ben Stiller, says, well why not six minute abs? That's what it was like in policy debates with Bernie. We would propose a bold infrastructure investment plan or an ambitious new apprenticeship program for young people and then Bernie would announce basically the same thing, but bigger. On issue after issue, it was like he kept proposing four minute abs or even no minute abs. Magic abs! She then acts it out in a even more condescending manner. Someone sent me a Facebook post that summed up the dynamic in which we were caught. Bernie, I think America should get a pony. Hillary, how will you pay for the pony? Where will the pony come from? How will you get Congress to agree to the pony? Bernie, Hillary thinks America doesn't deserve a pony. Bernie supporters, Hillary hates ponies, dude! I'm a Bernie bro and I hate women! Hillary, actually, I love ponies. So she's kind of pandering. <laughs> Bernie supporters, She changed her position on ponies! Hashtag witch Hillary! Hashtag witch Hillary, I hate women! I'm a misogynist! Headline, Hillary refuses to give every American a pony. Debate moderator, Hillary, how do you feel when people say you lie about ponies? The passage seemed to capture her cloistered mentality and point of view, which is that anything outside of what she was advocating for is seen as non-pragmatic and ridiculous and it's like magic abs and it's like ponies. It's like she's not even listening to the policy conversation, not even really like paying attention to what they're actually talking about. She's just saying anything I don't believe is completely fantastical and magical. And that's a kind of elitism and elitist attitude which I think doesn't help the Democrats. So those were like the pre-leaked passages. I wanted to see if maybe the book was different. So I want to be fair. I'm going to try to talk about the pros of the book and the cons of the book. It's really long. It's like 500 something pages and it doesn't really know what it wants to be. It's kind of like a memoir of her career and her life and the early sections are all about her childhood, all that sort of thing. But as it goes on, it gets increasingly more political and she starts talking more about policies. And it's also like a travelogue as well. And it keeps building up throughout the book to the election. It talks about people on her team and talks about the strategies they employ. It talks about her speeches, it talks about her gaffes and mistakes she made or things that she perceives to be mistakes. Every chapter Deb begins with like an inspirational quote from a strong woman slash Friedrich Nietzsche. And as it moves on, it goes back and forth between kind of attempting to be funny and lighthearted and being serious and talking about policy and so forth. The later parts of the book are almost entirely about Russia and hacking the Koch brothers and big money and politics, WikiLeaks and conspiracy theories. A lot of things about James Comey and the FBI and her emails and how James Comey said late in the election how she couldn't secure her server and it was irresponsible and how that totally fucked her up and she didn't know why Comey did that. The book covers all of this ground. I was interested to see how much self-reflection there would be in the book and there were some bits and pieces. Still, as I've discussed throughout this book, I do think it's fair to say there was a fundamental mismatch between how I approach politics and what a lot of the country wanted to hear in 2016. That was my problem with many voters. I skipped the venting and went straight to the solving. So condescending. So the book starts with her going to Trump's inauguration and feeling sick. The new president's speech was dark and dystopian. I heard it as a howl straight from the white nationalist gut. Its most memorable line was about American carnage. A startling phrase more suited to a slasher film than an inaugural address. Trump painted a picture of a bitter, broken country I didn't recognize. And then working backwards to how America got to that point. And one thing that's clear from early on in the book is that she really, 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 really wanted to be president. I also was unsatisfied with the draft for the victory speech I was supposed to deliver on Tuesday night. It didn't feel right. Too small, too political, not worthy of the moment. I felt the weight of expectations and history pressing down on me. Obviously losing the presidency is really hard so then there's all of these details about her doing yoga and how to breathe like you breathe in one nostril and out the other nostril and she talks about how she prayed a lot walking around the woods how much she loves her dogs her grandchildren give her so much joy she wanted to solve the AIDS crisis she was so razor focused on policy and all she cared about was fixing everything and she remembers a little girl who looked up to her and was like Hillary one day I can be president too and she's like yes you can 
can and then they did a high five or whatever. Small random details, which I think would be of interest if you're a Hillary Clinton fan, I suppose, but for someone like me is just wondering about what went on in the presidential election. All of these superfluous details are a little odd. She's kind of building a bit of a cult of personality around herself. There was only one customer in the place, an older African-American gentleman sitting alone by the window, engrossed in a book. I was reluctant to disturb him, but we made eye contact. I walked over to say hello and ask what he was reading. The man looked up and said, First Corinthians 13. I smiled. Love is patient. Love is kind. I said, it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Damn. This kind of perfect being just exists in her own magical space, but it's completely misunderstood because if they could just see the truth of how brilliant she is, then they would all instantly change their minds about Hillary Clinton. You get the sense like that. There's some really bad sloppy writing in there. I guess it was a ghostwriter, so she's just dictating like stream of consciousness to somebody and they wrote it all down. But some of the details are so mundane and strange, I just have no idea why they're in the book. And her sense of humor is really odd and I can't relate to it at all. For example, then there was the food we ate all over the country. We had a few favorite spots, a Middle Eastern takeout place in Detroit, a Cuban restaurant by the airport in Miami, lattes made with honey and lavender from a bakery in Des Moines. At the Iowa State Fair in the 100 degree August heat, I drank about a gallon of lemonade. Nick handed me a pork chop on a stick, which I devoured. When we got back to the plane, I told him, I want you to know that I did not eat that pork chop on a stick because it is politically necessary. I ate that pork chop on a stick because it was delicious. He nodded wordlessly and kept eating his own state fair discovery. Red velvet funnel cake. Why are you telling us about this? Even the guy you're talking to sounds confused. The guy's like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, Hillary. And just goes back to eating his cake. And the book is just crammed with this kind of shit. These weird superfluous passages, constantly competing with her saying, AIDS in Africa is a really big problem. Child poverty is a big deal and we have to deal with the prison system. I have all of these pragmatic solutions. And the opioid crisis. By the way, let me talk about drinking lemonade for some reason. It makes me think she did have way too much time on her hands and just had to get everything out. I guess her editors were a bit restrained. We don't want to get on a bad side. Passages like this sound incredibly stream of consciousness. There is no stopping the selfie. This is how we mark a moment together. And to be clear, if you see me in the world and want a selfie and I'm not on the phone or racing to get somewhere, I'll be glad to take one with you. But I think selfies come at a cost. Let's talk instead. Do you have something to share? I want to hear it provided it's not deeply insulting. I have limits. I'd love to know your name and where you're from and how things are going with you. That feels real to me. A selfie so impersonal. Although it does give your wrist a break from autographs. Now obsolete. Really weird grammar. Just rambling, confusing stuff. And I could go on and on with that. There's a surprising number of random passages that aren't saying anything. She talks about how sexism and misogyny got in the way of her winning. Both sexism and misogyny are endemic in America. If you need convincing, just look at the YouTube comments or Twitter replies when a woman dares to voice a political opinion or even just share an anecdote from her own lived experience. People hiding in the shadows step forward just far enough to rip her apart. And on this section I thought, yes, that's a fair point because as much as I don't care for Hillary Clinton because of her stale ideas and the fact that she seems so against really fighting for progressive policies, very many times I have encountered people who criticize Hillary Clinton just on purely sexist grounds. You see a lot of stuff like that, particularly on Fox News where they're not even criticizing her. It's just sexism. She's a stereotypical bitch. Or at least call her a vaginal American and suppose opposed to... Is that the new friend? I think and she's trying to run away from this uh, tough uh, kind of bitchy image. Women are too emotional or maybe they're bitchy sometimes. Don't vote for her, but you're not allowed to say that. We need to try, convict, and shoot Hillary Clinton in the vagina. You know, personally, I, I would cast <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman to play uh, Hillary no. Clinton. And if Hillary Clinton becomes president in 2016, she will not only be our first female president, she could be our first lesbian president. I met her in a bar room in Memphis. I can't, now I can only think of Hillary Clinton. Honky tonk women, crooked Hillary, pole dancing, Bernie Sanders supporters throwing dollar bills at her with hot sauce in the purse for the poll. No, no, I think uh, Hillary has, you know, feels a little insecure because she's a female running to be the commander in chief. Get a woman in the Oval Office, most powerful person in the world, what's the downside? You mean besides the PMS? And was there an element of sexism that was working against her? Absolutely, but Barack Obama had racism working against him obviously, and he managed to pull off a win. There wouldn't be enough to excuse her losing, but it is a fair point. There is a lot of sexism. And actually found later in the book when she talks about Russia and hacking and fake Facebook ads, that that gave me a new perspective on the election. She includes quite a lot of information about 
shady things that the Russians were up to. And as far as I can tell, the number one reason she believes she lost was because of the emails and FBI Director James Comey announcing that she was irresponsible with her server in the very last days of the election. I think it's easy to dismiss that as an excuse, but obviously it did have a very big impact. And she also talks a lot about Trump's racist pandering and uh, shady tactics by him. But I think the number one thing that people wanted was her to take responsibility for her own shortcomings, which she does a little bit towards the end of the book. None of the factors I've discussed here lessen the responsibility I feel or the aching sense that I let everyone down, but I'm not going to sulk or disappear. I'm going to do everything I can to support strong democratic candidates everywhere. If you're reading this book, I hope you'll do your part too. However, she also throws in weird jabs at, for example, Obama for giving her bad advice. Throughout the primaries, every time I wanted to hit back against Bernie's attacks, I was told to restrain myself, noting that his plans didn't add up, that they would inevitably mean raising taxes on the middle class families, or that they were little more than a pipe dream. All of this could be used to reinforce his argument that I wasn't a true progressive. My team kept reminding me that we didn't want to alienate Bernie's supporters. President Obama urged me to grit my teeth and lay off Bernie as much as I could. I felt like I was in a straitjacket. Thanks, Obama. She blames other people for her own gaffes, such as her gaffe with the coal miners. I'm the only candidate which has a policy about how to bring economic opportunity using clean renewable energy as the key into coal country. Because we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. Right, Tim? Democrats' long-standing support for environmental regulations that protect clean air and water and seek to limit carbon emissions has been an easy scapegoat for the misfortunes of the coal industry and communities that have depended on it. The backlash reached a fevered pitch during the Obama administration, despite strong evidence that government regulation is not the primary cause for the industry's decline. The Obama administration was slow to take on this false narrative. I would say that's incredibly unproductive and I don't know the point of that. And she's allowed to get those grievances out there, but people are also allowed to say it's not very constructive. She tries to kind of thread the needle between blaming herself and blaming things that were completely beyond her control. I take absolute personal responsibility, I replied. I was the candidate. I was the person who was on the ballot. Then I explained that while we didn't run a perfect campaign, Nate Silver, the widely respected statistician who correctly predicted the winner in 49 states in 2008 and all 50 in 2012, has said that we were on our way to winning until Jim Comey's October 28th letter derailed us. You can agree or disagree with that analysis, but it's what's Silver's data said, and she describes how the reaction to that was extremely negative. I understand why some people don't want to hear anything that sounds remotely like relitigating the election. People are tired, some are traumatized, others are focused on keeping the discussion about Russia and the national security realm and away from politics. I get that. I get all that, but it's important that we understand what really happened, because that's the only way we can stop it from happening again. The idea that there is a somewhat abstract extra variable which is Hillary herself, all of her baggage and all of her history, is not completely insane. And I think something Hillary herself doesn't dismiss, but she then goes on to talk down to Bernie Sanders, his supporters, randomly throw Barack Obama under the bus at places, and then spent so much of her time talking about what a great person she is, how much she tried, how much she cared. I think that's great and that's fantastic. It's just a lot of people don't want to fucking hear about it very much. Because all they really want is somebody focused on the issues and focused on the problems, not focused on themselves. It very much seemed like Hillary thought it was her turn. And she came very close and she didn't quite get there. So much fear mongering about the kind of president she would be that I just don't believe. But at the end of the day, there's just too much in this book about herself, to be frank. Part of the reason people like Bernie Sanders is because he does represent more of an idea. People who are more tuned into the ins and outs of party politics and how the Senate works and how the Congress works are gonna say Bernie Sanders being an idea and being a progressive ideal is silly. What they need is somebody who knows how to work within the system. Progressives are dreamers who have all these crazy airy-fairy ideas about magic abs. Them taking that stance ignores this whole swath of people who voted for hope and change in 2008 the audacity of hope for the idea of a progressive ideal. That's part of what makes people vote. So it's, it's sort of the difference between so-called pragmatism and policy and sort of concrete ideas like Hillary says she has and puts forth and a kind of vision for universal health care and a goal which is much further down the road. And if she had just had that kind of spark that excites people, she could have won just like Obama won because he managed to create that. I'm with her is just a kind of narcissistic message. If they could just see 
the reality of how great she was, they would vote for her in a second, but just makes her look self-absorbed. And I think a lot of the criticism was just, she needs to get out of the way, she needs to let in the new blood, let them make their decisions. There's Cory Booker and Kamala Harris, and they may be kind of establishment Democrats as well, but they are new. They're new people. They don't have the baggage, they haven't been around so long. I still think it's going to be better than having someone like Hillary Clinton who's been around for so long and has just not made an impact in terms of a wider appeal outside of kind of like a key base of people who just see her as not even the second coming at this point but like the fifth coming. I think that time has passed. Remember I did win more than three million votes than my opponent so it's like really We've kind of ripped off the bandage of Hillary getting her book out of the way so that people can kind of move forward now. So that's just some overall impressions of this book. Would I recommend it? It's really overlong. It's really fucking bloated. I had to keep forcing myself to pick it up again. And it's really unstructured. But I think if you actually take the time to read the book, there are elements of it which are substantial. The part about Russia was probably the best written part of the book. And the parts about her personal adventures and travels were inane. And I didn't get what they were for. Did I learn anything new from the book? Were the people on Twitter who said, you haven't even read the fucking book. If you read the book, your whole opinion would be completely different. Were they right? A little right. There was more substance in it than I expected, but there was also so much fucking filler. And I guess that's just the thing. If you're a famous person, you can write a book, which is just full of random crap and people will buy it because you're a famous person. I, I can't speak to Bernie Sanders book. I don't know how that's written. I don't know how relevant to politics a lot of it is, but it wouldn't be that hard to be a bit more focused than this book was. If you're a fan of Hillary Clinton, I suppose you will enjoy this, but a bit too much of it came off just like her talking about how awesome she is in a roundabout way. If you analyze my campaign, it was actually actually brilliance, but just nobody quite understand. I give the book 5 out of 10.